So I mentioned that I want to emphasize diversity of ways of getting around. I just have a few photos. And in my photos, again, not trying to cover up all the challenges, but for this, I must have probably thousands of photos of things blocking sidewalks and dangerous places for pedestrians and cyclists and so on. But I decided for today, after we talk about you know, wanting to also try and think positively, to use more positive pictures and to show diversity of ways of getting around. So this is a picture I took, which I really love, uh, of a guy, as, as you can see, on a skateboard, but pushing a stroller. So uh, that's the first one. You can go to the next slide. I just have a few quotes to kind of set the scene. Um, Newfoundland and Labrador ranks last among the provinces, and this is not so positive, <laughs> and 26th among the 29 comparator reasons overall in health. That's, I don't know if you can see the bottom uh, attribution, but it's from the recently released Newfoundland Health, Newfoundland and Labrador Health Accord report. Um, there are some reasons for that, such as an aging population, but it's also true that our children are among the healthiest. and. It seems to me, and I know from research, not only my opinion, that one of the simplest things people can do to improve their health is to use active transportation, even if that only means getting to the bus stop. Um, and yet, it's most of the time not safe, for example, for our children to get to school by walking or by bicycle. So uh, health is one reason to try and make it possible for people to do that. Okay, next slide. Um, this is a picture, maybe it's a little bit dark, but it's the Waterford River Trail, which is one of the very few multi-purpose trails in St. John's. Uh, so it is a, a safe way of getting across the city east to west. One of the barriers people often talk about in terms of using, especially cycling, but active transportation generally in St. John's, is the hills. But east-west is nearly flat. So this trail goes east-west from downtown out to Bowery Park and beyond along the old railway line, as some of you know, I'm sure. Uh, it's a very beautiful trail and it's multi-purpose. So you see wheelchair users, cyclists, and pedestrians. So it's just a bit of inspiration. Um, another quote, there's a lot of research on this actually. I already mentioned health, but people who use active transportation, and again, even if it only means getting out to the bus stop rather than using a private vehicle, are not only healthier, but also happier than those who drive, which is uh, kind of interesting. There's quite a lot of research on, so I cited one of the studies, but there, there are many. And I didn't, this is not a scholarly presentation, so I didn't give all the references, but if anybody's interested, you can let me know at the break and I'd be happy to share references with you on that. Okay, next slide. Uh, this one is such a simple picture, really. It is just a nice, wide sidewalk that's nice and clear, doesn't have ten telephone poles in the middle, doesn't have snow. <laughs> Three people can travel abreast. And just as a description of the picture, uh, one of the people is walking with a cane, and one is in a wheelchair. They're of diverse um, of ethnic backgrounds and body sizes. Um, so just it's just kind of my ideal world, that picture. And so simple, it's just a sidewalk. Um, and this, uh, so we've got health and happiness. The third reason is climate. I read somewhere that the single uh, most significant per thing that an individual can do to help lower emissions and address climate change is to use active transportation. I think that's a, a little bit a little bit debatable. There are other important things we can do too, but it's certainly one of the key things that an individual can do as opposed to a government or a city or an institution um, is to move without a private car as much as possible. So uh, this statement is from the St. John's Climate Action Plan. So the city has already committed to this, keep that in mind. Uh, to implement the Bike St. John's Master Plan, and com which also ultimately also means making accessible trails for wheelchairs and other modes of transportation, and complete a review of walking infrastructure needs. To my knowledge, neither of those have been started. If anybody knows different, I'd love to hear during the discussion, <laughs> but I don't think so. Okay, next slide. Um, 
So this is uh, the other multi another multi-purpose trail in CBS. Uh, just a picture of uh, a friend of mine with a bicycle on the trail, which is paved up to there, but beyond there, it's gravel and has barriers. So, but that far, it was accessible for all modes of transportation. And I think I have three or four pictures. You can just go through them, and I'll just. Oh no, there's one more quotation. I love this quotation. It's my final one. This again, it's so simple, really. It seems to me, sidewalks are a fundamental element of the urban transportation infrastructure. It is, and I'll say cycling uh, lanes as well. I talked about multi-purpose trails, but just separated lanes, a whole network so people can actually get where they're going. It is bizarre that any city would fail to provide the same level of service for sidewalks and cyclists that it does for roads. This makes its pedestrians and cyclists second-class citizens. To me, that says it all. And that's from uh, an Ottawa-based urban, urban geographer, Barry Muller. Uh, this is a picture of my grandson. Again, it's a very simple thing. He's just walking on a nice, clear sidewalk, which we don't always see here. And even when we do see them, they're only, it's a very, it's about 10% of the sidewalks of the city that are cleared, which is not a lot. Most comparable cities clear between 60 and 100%. Uh, this is a bit of the Rennies River Trail, which has a sign saying it's accessible. This is my only, in a way, negative slide, although it's a beautiful picture. Uh, but it has signs saying it's wheelchair accessible, but it isn't because this leads to a set of stairs, and there are several set of stairs, so I'm not sure why they say it's accessible. But it's a bit of inspiration as a beautiful trail. I wish it was all like that and wider. Um, other, another very simple bit of infrastructure that if you came here by bicycle, you will have noticed does not exist anywhere near this hotel, is places to <laughs> lock your bicycle safely. This is from Shediac, New Brunswick, the lobster feature. They have these um, bike, which is not a rich community, you know, it's not a wildly expensive piece of infrastructure, but these are everywhere in Shediac, so I had to take a picture of one. And a lot of people cycle, and that's one of the reasons why. Uh, this is my last slide. I saw this uh, a year or two ago, and I just had to take a picture. So our sense of humor is one of the great resources that we have here. It says, see the amazing clear sidewalk, one block only, free admission. <laughs> uh, and now, uh, I, will read, I will read Ryan Green's uh, statement since he thought he wouldn't be here to read himself, and he still want me to to okay, and then I'll uh, hand it over to the panelists. So, from Ryan Green, who is a chair, is that right, of Bicentennial? Uh, director. Director of Bicentennial. There are a few things that I find more enjoyable than going for a bike ride with my kids. I can tell they love it too. The fresh air and heightened senses for being outdoors elicit a sense of calm. We feel connected to our environment and to our community. The best conversations are triggered. An otherwise mundane commute becomes time for bonding. Some of the reasons why people are happier as well as healthier. I have raced, adventured, and commuted via bicycle in many places. As an avid cyclist, I feel confident enough to use a bike for transportation on the streets of St. John's, though it can still be an uncomfortable and alienating experience. However, as a parent with my daughters in tow, I fall under a completely different risk profile. I'm slower, less maneuverable, and far more risk adverse with precious others with precious cargo on board. As with many residents in the city, I would love for my family to bike more frequently and to more places, but it often feels reckless to share space with vehicles. The lack of cycling infrastructure and limited options for comfortable traffic calm routes means that most times it is more prudent to hop in the car. As a parent and a citizen, it saddens me that children in our city do not have equal access to mobility and autonomy. They have a right to safely walk, bike, and play in their communities and should not be solely dependent on motor vehicles for transportation. I think St. John's has an opportunity to be a much better place to live for people who have not been well served by the transportation status quo. A cultural shift away from vehicle-centric planning and engineering is required here. More inclusive infrastructure and safer streets benefit us all. If we design our city for kids, we will win.
going to go alphabetically, if that's okay with everybody, which means that Jessica Barrett is going to be Oh, oh, I'm just my last name. Oh, okay. <laughs> the old fashioned way. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, Sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right. I've uh, got a nice little slideshow. Um, are you able to get the slideshow up there? The green one. I have it open. Or did it. there are a few options for getting around with the kids, usually walking, busing, or cabbing. Cabbing gets expensive very fast, so it's usually our last option um, if it's miserable, miserable weather or we're going somewhere where the bus is, does not make it accessible for us, like the airport. <laughs> um, if you are busing with children, you are usually still using an alternate method of transportation as well, whether it's taking a carrier, a baby carrier, or the stroller. And with the stroller, you still have to try and get that onto the bus. The bus driver is not allowed to help you. You have to take your child out of the stroller, usually. On the busier routes, you're not allowed to leave the child in the stroller. So you have to take the child out of the stroller, take your stuff out of the stroller, fold the stroller up, and get that all onto the bus. You are traveling on your own with the kids you have to do all of that by yourself then you have to get the stroller out of the way on the bus uh, and if you are using a bigger stroller that is not an easy thing to do um, meanwhile you're also juggling your children and if they're very small where are you putting them <laughs>
your destination when you're choosing your method of transportation is the place that you're going accessible for your stroller? Are you going to a restaurant where you are going to need to take your child out of the stroller to sit at the table? Where are you putting your stroller while you're in the restaurant? Does it fold up small enough? Is there a space for it folded up to put somewhere where it's not going to get stolen, uh, but still be out of the way of the waiters, the other customers, all of that fun stuff. mostly three kinds of strollers that the average person is going to choose from. The umbrella stroller, your basic hard wheel stroller, and the bigger jogging stroller. Uh, the umbrella stroller is the one that folds up the smallest, is the lightest, is the easiest to travel with. It's also usually very lightweight and not very sturdy. Uh, I had an umbrella stroller when I took my kids to Halifax to visit my parents. Uh, it's great for on the plane, uh, very small, lightweight, stores out of the way. It was great you know, to just have while traveling. And then when we came back, I was using it every day to travel to work because I could fold it up and leave it at the daycare out of the way. And it didn't take up any space. So I'm walking home one day with, I was pregnant and I had my not quite two year old in the stroller. We're walking across a crosswalk and one of my wheels falls off and just starts going ahead and down without me, down the crosswalk. So we had to stop and call a friend to come pick us up because I couldn't get home with only three wheels. Um, the hard wheel stroller is, is pretty good on paved surfaces, no complaints there. Uh, I had a double stroller for a time that had kind of a rubbery wheel, just basic stroller, it was fine to get around until winter anyway. Uh, once you get into winter, the snow clearing isn't always that great uh, and there's still a layer of snow left on the ground and it is really hard to push those hard wheeled strollers through it. So finally we come to the jogging stroller. It has bigger tires that you fill with air like a bicycle tire. Uh, you can actually see the little knobs, you fill it up with a bicycle pump whenever the tires get low. And that is kind of stroller I've had since my son was born, uh, my oldest, and it's the kind we still use now. And as great as it is most of the time, it is a bigger, wider stroller, so we don't always fit everywhere. It's a lot harder to get off the bus because it's, it's big, it folds in half, uh, so you still have the full width of those back wheels to worry about. Um, at my local grocery store, I only fit through one of the two checkout aisles. So I have to wait in the smoke and lottery line because that's the only aisle I fit through. If they open up the other one, gotta let everybody else go. I can't move. <laughs> um, so here's my picture of a St. John's sidewalk. You can see uh, in the corner there that despite a sidewalk plow having been by, there is still snow that you have to push your stroller through. And those hard wheeled strollers aren't aren't going to make it through. <laughs> you know, they're pushing and you know, lean way back trying to get the traction to push through. It's not so much fun. Uh, you also have to deal with the snow banks from people clearing their driveways and they pile all the snow on the sidewalk. Um, on Mary Meeting Road, generally one half of road is totally inaccessible for most of the winter because of the snow banks at every single driveway. Uh, this is, it, it is an outdated picture. This store has been updated with an automatic door, but you can see the wheelchair parking spaces there and a door that does not open automatically. There's no wheelchair buttons to, uh, to open that door. They do not open automatically when you stand in front of them, or they did not, they, they do now. And, and the um, sidewalk is actually on a slope, not the sidewalk, the, the parking space is on a slope. So have fun with wheels on that. Um, while you're trying to open the door one-handed, push the stroller in with your other hand, 
and uh, like Elizabeth was saying, telephone poles <laughs> in the sidewalk. That's a fun one to get around. That's on uh, Pennywell Road when you're on your way to Rope Walk from Freshwater Road. Uh, the house in the second picture is next to my house. It is into the sidewalk. You can barely walk past it in front of the steps there. That are, there's maybe a foot, maybe a foot between the front steps and the curb. I have to go into the road if I don't want to cross the street. And that's the end of my slideshow. <laughs> ago I wrote a post on Elizabeth um, weblog about navigating St. John's as a perspective of an international student uh, without a car. Um, but then I talked um, to uh, international students about this topic because at the internationalization office we host discussion group and um, coffee club every week. So I just asked them that I'm attending this panel and I'm going to talk about this, what do you think? And I decided to share their points because they were so much more interesting than mine. Um, so first feedback was, um, Bahar, decision makers uh, haven't ever experienced living without the car. Or if they had, um, they had a so strong community around them. So they don't get what you are trying to say, so why do you even care? So it was the first feedback. And uh, then they started talking about their experiences that uh, one of them told that I got a chance to get a car um, for seven months um, and I had a totally different experience. And he was saying that uh, you cannot live a full life without the car here in Newfoundland and your experience is totally different. You enjoy a life a lot more when you get a car and when you have access to car. And I think that's uh, very true when talking about car, um, car insurances. <clears throat> For many newcomers, insurance companies don't um, consider your um, driving experiences or uh, insurance history back in your country. Um, so for many, uh, newcomers, they need to up, they need to pay up to 500 or more monthly for car insurance. So it's almost impossible to get a car for many people. One. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, one of the students mentioned that uh, when you search about having fun in Newfoundland, you see all of these beautiful trails and these uh, amazing places that you can go and visit, but without a car, you cannot go for hiking. You cannot visit these amazing places. One of the students, uh, she's been here for two semesters and she hasn't, um, she couldn't, um, or she hasn't get a chance to even um, visit the Middle Cove Bridge. And everyone was so surprised how, and she was like, how am I supposed to get there to mm -hmm. see that spot? So that's another thing that many students feel that uh, they missing out, especially when the weather is good because everyone is talking that, oh, it's summer, make sure that you take, <laughs> take your time and explore the city, but how? Mm -hmm. uh, you need to, get a, to have a car to get there. And especially after the pandemic, many students, many new students, they are having a hard time to create their community around them. They don't have many friends. They 
don't have any local friends with car and everything. So it's getting much more difficult for them to explore the city. Um, some of them talk about uh, how they feel that they are discriminated against because they don't have a car. One, one girl mentioned, and she had tears when she was sharing this story that she worked at the minimum wage job at the uh, top sale, I guess. And um, so she takes a bus to get there, and she always um, makes sure to have like at least two hours to get to work, like on time, but things happen, some bosses just leave earlier, you miss the boss, and you, are, and you need to wait like for more than one hour to get the next one, and you cannot afford a cab, so you need to walk and you get to work uh, late. And she said that my manager criticized me all the time about not being punctual and compared me with my um, local um, local uh, staff over there and one of them <laughs> one of the local staff told her that I got up like if I have a shift at 8 a.m. I got up at 7 30 and it's just it's just 10 minutes right to get here so she was like it's not fair at all I imagined so you get to school to your job interview to like many occasions and it's not the public transport is not reliable, you cannot count on it, and it can affect your, um, like your life in many different levels, like for the job opportunities, or even if you wanna get, to, even if you wanna date, it's very difficult. We had a very fun <laughs> conversation around that, that. It's very difficult to date when you don't have a car. It's just, um, many people just, gave up <laughs> dating, <laughs> so, yeah. And, um, yeah, so one of them mentioned that, uh, it was a very thoughtful comment, that um, he said that we don't um, walk because we need to reach 10,000 steps on our smartphone. We walk to get to work, to get to school, to get to our doctor appointments, or different things in our life. And um, and one um, other new student, he mentioned that when I walk um, in St. John's, I feel that I'm poor, because I don't see many people walking around. I feel like I'm one of those who can, everybody knows that I cannot afford having a car, that I'm from a low uh, like economic status and I don't feel good at all. So uh, yeah, that was an interesting um, feedback. Um, and they talked a lot about um, bus stops and um, why bus stops are not sheltered in Newfoundland. <laughs> and like given the weather, it's just, it, it doesn't make any sense that they are not sheltered, and it was like, yes, it doesn't make any sense, but um, I think in one of these photos, um, it's okay. Um, so, um, oftentimes when you manage in like, in a very bad weather and during the winter, when you manage to get to the bus stop, the bus stop is not cleared, so you are forced to stand up in the middle of the street waiting for a bus. And imagine that you are waiting to go to some important meeting for your, um, I don't know, job interview or any other things, and you are splashed with all dirt, and you end up getting to that interview or your date with like your um, dirty clothes. And it's not safe, of course. Um, so if I want to finish with something positive, <laughs> so when I was so lucky to get to get here long before pandemic and in August. So my first uh, impression of St. John's in Newfoundland was beautiful summer, 
and I got a chance to go for hiking and just see Atlantic Ocean was just amazing. And uh, it's not good. It's 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 a steal. Every time I see the ocean, I it's like, wow. <laughs> it's just impossible to be this close to the ocean. And uh, during the beautiful fall, um, my first fall here, I got a chance to just explore the city. I was just walking around and um, last night I was just uh, searching my Google photo to see the photos that I took back um, then, my first um, year here. <laughs> I uh, realized that I had many pictures of houses, mm -hmm. like not only beautiful, colorful houses, random houses. <laughs> and I remembered that um, so the foreign um, architecture, the, everything was so new to me. I, I was like, oh my God, I'm walking <laughs> um, here and it, it, it feels like that I'm walking in one of those movies or cartoons that I used to watch when I was a child. So and now that I'm thinking that it, it was like, uh, it was kind of creepy to just stand up and <laughs> <laughs> took photo of people's houses. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, I shared it with many of my friends back home. They were like, wow, this is like that cartoon and this cartoon. And, and um, yeah, so I, I love <coughs> local cafes. So I, 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 found, I, I got a chance to just see different cafes, stores. And um, I remember in my second week here, I was just walking and um, a very uh, nice old lady, she was um, sitting in her um, deck, I think, and she just invited me to have a cup of tea with her. And we had this interesting conversation, and it's been, it's been six years, and I, we still are contacting each other. Uh, she gives me a call for Nowruz, ring in um, New Year. I make sure to contact her for Christmas and New Year. And I thought that just by walking, you can make connections, you can make friends. And if we see more people just walking around and commune, you can just start talking and make friendship. And it creates a sense of belonging for those people who are new here and they are from a very different background, um, countries that are, um, are not very similar to here. And um, I also work with um, Afghan refugees. And um, so once they arrive, they, um, they go directly to the best Western hotel close to the airport, which I don't know why they decided that's the best spot. Um, and because of the housing situation, many of them forced to stay there for a few months. And I was so, I felt so bad for them because they couldn't leave that place. If they forced to stay there for a few months because for myself to go there to do like translation stuff during the weekend, um, it took me like two, more than two hours to just go there and get back. And it was like, what a great impression for refugees. They just, and they are like young children, families. Um, and they were, and they asked me that, um, so is it only here or if we go like somewhere else in the city, is it easier to uh, just commute? And I was like, and I didn't want to be like negative or something. And I said, yeah, it's getting much better. But in this housing situation, many of them just ended up having houses in Mount Pearl or like other areas with like terrible public transport. So um, yeah, I, I often think about them and their experience of being here in Newfoundland and how they can just create their community and just uh, yeah, survive. Um, and, we, uh, and government often talk about attracting newcomers or refugees or welcoming refugees or retaining international students. But I think, um, yeah, it's my last sentence. No, <laughs> I think, it's okay. <laughs> uh, I think uh, 
we need to at least um, make some um, create a better public transport system or cleaner sidewalks and to just welcome them uh, here, welcome them here and make their experience uh, much easier once they uh, get here. Thank you so much. I think I'd like to stand, but I, I know it's over there. Yeah. I'll just want like just Good morning, everybody. Um, the first thing I want to say is that I am a white settler, cisgendered, disabled female, and I want to make it very clear that for anybody who in our community who is racialized, indigenous, uh, gender diverse, or identifies in any way that is not, you know, typical. Everything I'm about to talk about around disability is greatly magnified and intensified for those people because they are living with multiple layers of marginalization and bias. Um, let me explain the cast and why I'm relying on Sighted Guide today rather than my guide dog. Um, on Easter Saturday, I was crossing the street on a crosswalk. Um, we were about, we being me and my dog, who was new to me by the way, and also traumatized, um, were maybe midway across the, the crosswalk. Um, I guess we weren't moving fast enough for drivers because a whole line of traffic, of course, began, began encroaching and, and uh, you know, zooming behind us on this crosswalk. My dog is trained. All guide dogs are trained to come to a complete stop if traffic is moving around or toward us. She stopped. And even a small lab, when they stop and dig in, it's like trying to move dark matter. If you have a dog, you know what I mean, right? So I was highly anxious because I knew Easter Saturday, turkeys are on sale at Dominion, my life means nothing right now. So, and of course, as they're zooming by, and multiple, I mean, tens of cars, um, now people are blaring their horns at me, which is elevating my anxiety. So I am now holding the dog's handle in one hand and with the leash, urging her forward. Because I was distracted in this way of the trying to get my dog and myself to safety, I didn't do what I usually do on crosswalks in St. John's because the curbs are not accessible. You may remember a couple of years ago, Elizabeth and many other activists, mobility activists in St. John's, we gathered on Water Street, we took yellow industrial chalk, and we chalked the edges of every step in every alleyway, including George Street, all through the downtown, um, to demonstrate what, what a small, inexpensive accommodation, how it can enhance safety, not only for visually impaired people, but for all people, right? That has never been followed up on by the city. So the curb was indetectable to me. I don't have depth perception. So what happened was I went ass over tea kettle onto that curb, broke my arm, messed up my back. Six weeks now I cannot work my dog. This means going back to retrain with her in, in Ottawa because if an animal 
experiences trauma or distress in a particular location or situation, it is probable that the animal will be averse to returning to that location or situation. It's costing me money for transportation. I have, and I'm very fortunate and privileged to have this, an army of friends and mutual support <laughs> kind of comrades who are helping with my dog, bringing groceries, all this kind of stuff. But it's, it is, and, and this is relatively minor compared to the multiple pedestrians who have died in St. John's um, in, in risky pedestrian conditions, right? So that explains the cast. And the, and the dependence right now. So that said, um, a friend of mine said to me last night, and I thought this was a really apt phrase, so I'm gonna open with this. In many ways, when it comes to mobility justice and ease, um, people who have disabilities are kind of like the canaries in the coal mine, right? If we are safe, if we are safe, chances are high that you're going to be a lot safer as well. And usually when I talk about accessibility, as we all do, I, I kind of um, sort of land on what the accommodations are. Like they need to do this, we need more ramps, we need more you know, accessible doorways, we need more audible crosswalks. By the way, by the way, speaking of mobility justice, we have 116 automated crosswalks in St. John's that are designed for people who can see. Okay, of those 116, 16 of them are accessible to me and people who cannot see. 16 audible crosswalks in the city. And you know what the big plan is? To add two a year. So in 50 years, I and people who experience uh, sight loss or even certain types of neurodiversity and children for whom audible, audible crosswalks are super beneficial because they kind of snap the driver into an attentive mode, right? 50 years is the plan. So today I'm not going to talk so much about solutions with regard to actual uh, bricks and mortar kind of accommodations. I'm going to talk about the thing behind the thing. I'm going to talk about attitude, I'm going to talk about ableism, and I'm talking about outright at this point, at this point, up until, I'm going to be generous, up until say 10, 12 years ago, we could kind of, sort of, kind of go with the narrative, this is unintentional bias. We can't say that anymore. I'm sorry. We can't say that people don't understand, and if they do understand, they do not belong in positions of leadership. Period. We have a very, we have a very diverse and increasingly diverse community, which is what we want. So it is no longer acceptable to say we didn't know. You know, and if you don't know move over and make space for a representative from one of those communities. Because diversity and representation of diverse generations, um, cultural backgrounds, um, racial backgrounds, religious backgrounds, indigeneity, gender diversity matters and it will make all the difference here. It really will. I'm going to throw some facts at you about well-documented forms of ableist discrimination and I'm going to follow them, each one of them, with an example of what's happening right now out of sight in St. John's. A study was done in the United Kingdom in the middle 2020 teens. It was an exploration into um, something called disability fraud. Notice the title. Notice what, how this is identified, okay? 
So disability fraud is, um, is an infraction of, of laws or uh, criteria to receive services, for example. And the idea is that you have people who are non-disabled posing as being disabled in order to get whatever benefit they perceive we have that they don't, right? So um, the result of the study was that in fact, although frequently there are, there are processes in place to protect um, the service givers from being fraudulently exploited, the fact of the matter is the data in that survey showed that in fact it only occurs 4% of the time. Only 4% of accusations of disability fraud were actually valid. If you Google, I invite you to do it because it's a real eye-opener, Google disability fraud. And you know what you're going to come across? Page upon page upon page upon page of how to turn your neighbor in, how to become a private investigator. You think you think somebody somebody in your workplace is is enacting this this crime of disability fraud? It's all about it's all gotcha gotcha gotcha. Okay. Another fact: it is far more likely, far more likely that a person who has a disability is passing as abled, not the other way around. I was one of them, right? There are many people, I'm sorry to get emotional, but this is my passion and my purpose. I will not stop talking about this until it's fixed. Um, a Powell, A is on the panel with me, has herself, themselves, written about this. Lisa Walters, who you may know as Damsel in Address, YYT, has written about this. We, many of us, have lived that experience of passing as able, because if you identify, your employment opportunities dry up, your living situation may evaporate, you experience discrimination. In St. John's right now, there is a whole revision of who is and who is not legitimately using GoBus. People who have lifelong immutable disabilities are being put through an interrogation process, which they have already qualified for this service. They have already qualified Yet because the service is overburdened, suddenly everybody is required to appear before a committee of health professionals and defend their disability. This is, I don't understand how this got, got by the Inclusion Advisory Committee. I don't know how disability organizations have not spoken up against this. So I was given permission to relay this story and I will, I will not mention the woman's name because it's her story. If there is a journalist present who wants to follow up with her, she's given me permission to give you her contact information. So a friend of mine who is a woman, she has cerebral palsy, which is um, a physical condition that uh, exists from birth. It's often the result actually of a birth injury. Um, and she has and will continue to use a wheelchair in all probability for the rest of her life. She was summoned to appear before this committee. Um, a kinesiologist was asking her questions. You know, what is the nature of your disability? I have cerebral palsy. The kinesiologist then um, continued to probe with other questions. Her response was, I don't have to answer those questions. I told you everything you want to know. There was resistance to her response. Her medical trauma brackets. What many non-disabled people may not know is how many people who have disabilities are living with medical trauma. There are many people who from early childhood have been, um, have been 
victims, I'm using that word kind of cautiously, but have, have experienced multiple very intrusive medical procedures and surgeries. There are many people who later in life may develop or acquire a disabling condition and they, if they sometimes are hard to diagnose, particularly if you identify as female, there'll be a lot of gaslighting. What you experience is gaslighting, right? Medical professionals who don't believe, believe your pain, um, uh, it may be a rare condition, it may take a long time to diagnose, so your family might think you're malingering, others may think you're malingering, you know, you're, and all the while you're in pain or you are like, it's a legit thing. But the result uh, is that this, this phenomenon of medical trauma is quite common among people with disabilities. End of bracket. Okay, so she has cerebral palsy, she, she responds to the kinesiologist, they're, they're kind of probing, oh, you have to do this, it's part of the process, blah, 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 blah. She's getting more and more agitated, she finally melts down, she's crying, she's trying to leave the room and wait for it. If you don't settle down, we're calling the police. Oh, oh my God. Oh. And she probably has to go bus to get there and come home. Yeah, I, yeah, that's a little much to digest, isn't it? This is St. John's, the city of legends. Come one, come all. You don't have to be born here, but you bloody well better come in with a very typical body and brain or your life is going to be really hard. I know it's Saturday. So what are some solutions? Universal design would be a good one. And the careful avoidance of universal design, both by our province and our city, should be a red flag. It is a red flag. We all were very saddened and shocked by the sudden death earlier this year of um, universal design like champion architect Grant Genova, you know, and, and his life was celebrated at City Hall, but the best memorial to Grant is to keep going with this work and get it done, right? Another solution, which I think is an absolute necessity, is that um, in every municipality in Newfoundland and Labrador, but especially in this one because by our sort of capital city status, we kind of are expected to lead the way. I think that it must be, whoa, that we the public must insist that for every council taking office, beginning with the next council, that it is absolutely mandatory that each and every one of them with their senior staff must take anti-racist, anti-colonial, anti-ableist training. It has to happen and it isn't, a, I believe that in light of everything I've just told you, that, that that training should be delivered by entities or organizations, first of all, by the people themselves, by racialized indigenous or disabled people. But I think that it is very unwise to continue to trust um, how should I put this? I don't think it should be in the hands of organizations who are receiving funding from the city. Um, I don't know what's happening because I'm not on the inside. I don't, I don't know how something like this go bus process, which is 
anybody who has any kind of basic literacy in, in disability theory would have shut that down in, in like a New York second. Um, so I, I cannot explain how that is, things like this are happening. Um, but it is possible that the fact that some organizations, if not all, are receiving funding from the city might be a kind of have silencing effect on that. I don't know. Um, so that would be another solution. Um, thirdly, I think that <clears throat> when elections come around, um, I think that we all have to be very cognizant of the fact that people who exist or come forward from any of the minorities that I've named uh, are going to have significant barriers. And I think the best that we can do for them is what we have to do. I think we really have to rally around diversity because I truly believe that doing the same thing only you know, with more energy, it's not, it's not going to fix anything. It's not going to fix anything. And I also believe that, you know, we get caught on this narrative of money. There's not enough money. There's not enough money. There's not enough money. There's enough money for the things that you consider to be of value. And there's a big difference between cost and value. And I think, I think, it, we have the ability to kind of change, like flip that script, to use an overused term, um, because it is a deflection. People are being hurt. People are living with a burden of poverty that's being imposed upon them that this is certainly a factor in. Um, even with the go bus thing, you know, like as a, as a visually impaired person, if they sort of, I don't use go bus, I never have. I do have the card. They haven't called me. I may have been, I don't know, but it's possible because I've never used it. They've just kind of written me off. It doesn't matter. Um, to me, it represents a loss of independence, honestly. So I, I avoid it. Um, but, You know, what other panelists have been saying is so true. It's like, I rarely use Metro bus because it's not accessible to me. There's no, no, I never know when the, where the bus is stopping. I'm like, well, where am I? Um, but also, uh, there's, it, there's not enough room to accommodate my guide dog, really. Like, the only place she can fit is in the aisle, so she's a tripping hazard, and I'm on complete lookout all the time, and I feel like I'm having to police all the other riders. Uh, which is very uncomfortable, but also as, I'm getting people mixed up now, but as, as one or two panelists pointed out earlier, you can get on a, on a metro bus on point A, which is reasonably accessible to any pedestrian, but you don't know what awaits you at your destination. You might be deposited in a snowbank, right? And then have to cross four lanes of traffic. Um, I think I'm getting close to my 10 minutes now, so I will leave it at that and thank you for your attention. And I do believe that like, if we keep pushing as a community and, and like, just stand in solidarity with each other, over time we will get this done. Thank you. take a minute and like stand up shake it off move around like we've heard a lot um, feeling a lot and it needs to be felt and said absolutely 
And the thing uh, coming in, I was already going to speak about this, but I feel the panel is touching on it anyways. If we actually start building things at the beginning that are workable for strollers, for people who use a power wheelchair, a manual wheelchair, um, for people who are delivering packages, whether that's their job or they're doing it just in that moment, um, and people who are just walking, then this, then that helps everybody. And where I think sometimes the city, it feels, is kind of um, made in a bit of a hodgepodge. One thing I can point out, oh my, like the rock star concerts are gonna throw my mask out <laughs> instead of the guitar. <laughs> Um, the bricks that are especially downtown at like right yeah the sidewalks um, as well as I think they're still on some of the streets they pave George Street don't they I think so they were put in I'm assuming I don't know this um, formally because they look good and it definitely you know as Anne pointed out the city of legends and the historic oldest city in the North America and they are about the worst things that you could possibly use um, for anybody because bricks shift over time and they don't shift in concert with each other. So you have one that's higher, another that's lower. Um, and it's a tripping hazard for someone who is completely able-bodied just walking down the road, as well as anybody who's using, again, a stroller, a wheelchair, um, a delivery driver, but I think there's a lot of, well, it looks good, and sometimes the cheaper option, but we need to start thinking about what's actually functional, and functional across the board. Uh, loose gravel is another instance, and you'll find that in parking lots and trails. Um, there's another, oh, well, and roads too often. And it's literally like quicksand for somebody using a wheelchair. Like there is absolutely no way to go. Oh, playgrounds, something I discovered when I had my son. So the playground, if I'm too close, just let me know. In Bannerman Park now has accessible um, ground, surface, thank you. Um, and definitely is harder for me to wheel on, um, so it wouldn't be accessible for everybody, but is way more accessible and actually safer for the children if they happen to fall. Um, but Bannerman Park and a little, a couple uh, of, pieces of the playground at Boring Park have it, and I think out in paradise, and that's about it. Um, once again, it can kind of come down to costs, and a lot of what I hear is that's just the way it is. So there's a lot of um, habit, really, um, both in terms of how we're building, as well as what we're laying down in front of us, as well as like how we're moving around in the city. So one interesting thing about me is I actually lived about half my life without a disability. So my disability came on when I was uh, in my mid to late 20s, and I was like champion horse rider. I literally used to ride my bike from downtown up to the stables at Clovelly and come back and like ride my horse and come back down again. Um, I biked all over the city, I walked, I used the bus when I was at Mun, so I have that experience. And I know how people treat you, yeah. and the things that you have available to you when you don't live without a disability, and then I also know what it's like when you do. Um, and I literally, um, when I went back to do my master's at Mun, I could have been at a campus in Calgary, and in my undergrad, I'd actually postered the entire campus for travel cuts. So I knew it inside out. Using a wheelchair, I had no idea how to get around because there's only certain exits and certain ways you can go and certain buildings you can get into. So even something as like quote unquote simple as that um, becomes another challenge. And when I was talking with Elizabeth about doing this panel, one of the things that was important to me was to talk about the psychological and emotional impacts of travel and um, accessible, active travel. Because, especially as somebody, like I hear a lot about um, the people I work with in physio and stuff, like, oh yes, it's so, it's so hard to get around in a wheelchair. I know what that's like, you know what? We had to do it for a day and it was just so hard. And yes, it is hard for a day. And what's really hard, um, as we know, with any identity that comes 
was not being considered or um, in the everyday or maybe even being considered um, something we want to get rid of, which as a trans person, I am not fully experiencing yet because I still, people still read me a certain way and don't get upset yet. Um, but I'm assuming that's gonna come at some point. Um, that we're constantly, like there's so, so much emotional labor, so much shame and blame on ourselves that I've, and like it it's, can often be called internalized depression. So all these ideas we grow up with, and that happened to me, like I had all these ideas about people with disabilities and then all of a sudden I was one. And it was like, all these things, I was like not capable of this and I was never gonna do that. And we need, as Anne says, like these role models and these examples of how we can do it. And it is out there. There are cities that are doing it way better than we are. And sometimes it's something as simple as, um, I talked with a man from Whitehorse and the way that they do it is um, the sidewalks or the islands are all like you come up to it. So the, the cars have to kind of go up a little bit of a not speed bump, like not quite that um, rigid, but like much smoother. And so there's no curb cuts, like you just kind of like come up and then you go down. There's a better explanation. It was several years ago, <laughs> please forgive me for that. But it was like, wow, like I've never thought about that. I've never seen it, which is why we don't have to reinvent the wheel. These things are out there. And the cost that comes and can be seen like throughout this panel in terms of frustrations. And they get like, we tend to, oh, it's a person with a disability and there's not too many of them and they're not out very much anyways. Well, we're not out very much because we actually often can't get out or get to the thing. Yeah, very much. Either or can't do it safely. Um, or uh, have spent the entire, like I've literally gone out and looked at um, making sure that I can get into the Atlantic place to go for a coffee with somebody when it was winter and two days beforehand there's no snow and the blue zones cleared out and um, because I could drive at this point and the laneway in the only accessible entrance for Atlantic Place was clear. Then we get snow so I had my friend take me down the next day and they had actually put all the extra snow into the blue zone spot so it wasn't only not cleared out it was actually used as like a dumping ground which again, I think says a lot about our priorities in terms of the people in power and where they're putting money and attention and solutions. Um, and I literally just like had to like climb over a snowbank with my friend, had to like help me and like get the chair on the other side. And it was, and like literally from one day to the next, it radically shifted even with me trying to plan. So in terms of psychological and emotional impact. Um, when I didn't have a disability, I felt like I had a lot more power over my life and where I went and what I did and how I did it. And I didn't have to plan in quite, I like being spontaneous, I'm neurodivergent. It's like part of how I come in the package. It's just the way it goes. But you can't be spontaneous with GoBus. Um, I have not used it, uh, like complete transparency, in about seven or eight years since I got pregnant and had a child, because it just, and I have the privilege currently, uh, for however long, that financially I'm able to manage that at the moment. And to me, it is one of, like, I will put money towards that before I'll put it towards many other things because of the empowerment it gives me to go, especially with a child, to like go to the park one day if I want, or when it's sunny. I mean, like, it's St. John's. We never know what the weather's gonna be like. Imagine trying to plan every time you want to go do something, you have to plan a week in advance and call somebody and say, like, do you have a ride or do you not? And then maybe they have to like, you know, okay, well, we can get you an hour before you want to go and uh, pick you up a half an hour after you want to leave. And even in terms of employability, so when we, myself and Elizabeth were talking, um, she helped me um, learn that here in St. John's, um, we give priority to the streets. So even if there's like a cul-de-sac that only has two or three houses on it, within two or three days, they have a priority that they'll make sure that that's cleared. Oh, within oh. a few hours. Oh, within a few within hours. Within hours, every street will have at least a first pass. And uh, <laughs> me again. Uh, so this was the um, consultation that the city itself paid for about six years ago, I think. They compared St. John's with five other, in many ways, comparable cities. 
we are not unique. Uh, and they found that our sidewalks are far worse in the winter, the way they're maintained, than any of the other cities. But our streets are cleared to a higher level than any of the other cities. So, you know, it really is about priorities. And then I think that comes back to uh, what one of, sorry, I really suck at names. So what one of the panelists had said in relation to classism, that like, okay, we're gonna prioritize the people who own cars and we're gonna make sure that they get to work and that they get to where they wanna go, but the people who need to walk or need to use buses are not prioritized. Um, and the, I think for real meaningful change, we need to be looking at things on this level. Um, as Anne pointed out with this inquiry, which to me literally has echoes of Spanish Inquisition and oh, witch trials, yeah, right, like completely. And I just wanna point out, if you were going for a job interview, it is literally illegal for you to ask any of those questions and to get all that detail. So why it's not illegal for them to do it, to be able to continue to use the service. And let me tell you, growing up, I was always the like, I'm gonna fight for the underdog. And then I guess I, in some ways I became the underdog. And I never in a million years thought that I would get to the place of vulnerability where I have been and continue to be in certain ways. And when that is how you get around, that is how you live your life. Because in this city, you cannot. I mean, accessible bus or like metro bus or not, which is a bit of a joke, like it's better than it was, but like, oh, and there's these like four stops on this route that were just not accessible because we couldn't put in the da da da. So <clears throat> there's that piece that to try to fight and stand up against the very people that have all the power for you to be able to live the life that you want in ways that you want is incredibly almost impossible. Like, you have to have, oh, I'm at 10 minutes. All right, yeah, yeah, you don't yeah. have to stop right now, but okay. just so you know. Wrap it up, yeah. <laughs> so again, like to come back to emotional impacts that you already feel like you're fighting every single day, and then when you have to fight even more, or like every single time you come up against a curb, like I've literally gone down a curb cut on one side, and I go across the street, and I'm in traffic, and there's no curb cut on the other side. Probably because that wouldn't look good in the middle of the sidewalk, not next to like the edge of a sidewalk or something. Um, and that's my reality, and like for over 20 years now. And the ability to just have the freedom and the choice. I am driving now, um, and like it just radically changes how I orient to myself and to other people and to my life, and it makes me way more employable. Um, and um, I'm just trying to think of what point to end on. In so in terms of something positive, the parlor actually has a um, portable ramp. So there's a doorbell you can ring, and they come out and they bring out um, a little rampy thing. And like me and my son have like stood on it, and he's all excited and like, <laughs> and you, I can get in and get ice cream with my child across the park. So there are there are lots and lots of solutions. Inclusion NL is a really great place to go for free support for businesses and organizations around accessibility. And um, I said to Elizabeth, I I want to challenge the city because they keep talking about dollars and about how much everything costs. And so it's like, okay, well, how about you make a priority to keep all the sidewalks around downtown and Churchill Square clear for all of December, and let's see how much money was spent this, that time compared to the year before. And if it's a lot more, because they're not looking at those pieces. It's like, actually, if you infuse money, you know, like, they've got to spend money to make money, well, and people can then actually access those businesses safely. Like, a lot of us, I'm sure probably, especially in this room, want to shop locally. But then I'm buying something off Amazon, I could go down to Hempware and get, because I can't get into Hempware. Um, so pieces like that, and like creative, fun solutions to drive people wild, <laughs> who don't have to think about these things. Um, I don't know if that is actually had any impact but if you do have any more questions or want to know more or like and i'm pretty open to ask like answering any question that somebody asks then elizabeth knows how to get a hold of me so, All right. thank you um i'm going to say uh, a quick word 
well, the wrong way around. <laughs> well, let's get set up. Um, this session is uh, running a little bit over time, and uh, if you need to take a really quick break now, I guess we might have a minute while Luke's setting up, but this is the last presentation, so don't go far. Uh, and the second morning uh, session is rather, probably rather shorter, Debbie tells me, than what it's scheduled, so we still will have time for, I think, at least a couple of questions and a break before going into the second session. So uh, once Luke is, uh, do you want to make your announcements Yeah, well, Luke's setting up, I'll do that. set up there? That's a good idea. <laughs> so then we'll make some announcements, then we'll have Luke, then we will still have time for a break, and then there'll be fantastic <laughs> session <laughs> after the break. So. Thank you. I can take my mask off while I'm doing that. Um, yeah, so while Luke's setting up, I was just going to give some thank yous. Um, we wanted to thank our sponsors, Mon and Rising Youth. I um, wanted to thank the organizing committee our board of directors and our volunteers, and a shout out to our map facilitators. So we're, there's some maps in the back that you can look at during the break if you want. Um, after this session, we're gonna have a quick 15 minute break. Take your time, we're not too worried. Um, and there's gonna be coffee and tea just outside and some muffins and cookies. Feel free to take as much as you want. Um, let me see if that's all I have, yes. Oh yes, there's a food policy here. You can't have outside food in this room. Leave us, go outside the door, you can eat whatever you want. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, during the lunch break, if you want to go out and like pick something up and bring it back, you can eat anywhere outside of this room. <laughs> and it's really nice outside, actually, so if you want to sit outside, even. Uh, yeah, that's it for dynamic presentation uh, prepared called uh, Yes, I Was Hit by a Bus, by Riding St. John's, and you could be too. I'm just teasing with the dynamic part. I, it's not going though, can I, am I scrolling? Oh, oh shit. Okay. There we go. Uh, this is the tweet that probably people in this room read. Um, I got hit by a metro bus. Uh, I was actually signaling, ironically, uh, to turn left down Cochrane Street, and uh, a metro bus driver tried to pass me and uh, hit me. And uh, my three-year-old was on the back. That was the next, uh, the next tweet in the thread. Uh, yeah, anyway, this is uh, just a sense of what the physical injury was. Um, of course, we foolishly, like uh, my wife kindly, would wipe down all the blood. <laughs> plastic that was embedded in my arm. So it's not as gruesome as it uh, you know, could have been. Oh, I should note, yeah, my three-year-old is fine. Um, I'm not sure how that was possible, but just the angle of attack, basically. She was in the back. And, uh, um, so it basically hit my elbow, uh, 
which was extended anyway to turn. I turned just like dummy signals left and right. Um, and she was looking the other way, so I thought we were going to be in therapy for years, but that was just me. Um, okay. This is a rendition for people who might be wondering. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it's even better in public, but uh, yeah, so you know, that's us. Basically, that is the basically where we were hit. I was in the middle of the lane, you know, taking the lane at that point because I was turning left. Um, I do tend to take the lane anyway, but uh, yeah, it was basically you pass me on the left. Some people have questions about this. Basically, um, you're trying to pass me on the left, and uh, we veered into incoming traffic, and um, I, I don't know. That kind of had a problem that day. <coughs> this is me. Uh, bikes equal freedom for kids, also for adults. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about Austin, where I really did most of my biking for about, I said a decade, it was more like 15 years. Uh, it's no bike paradise, but at least it never hit me with a city bus. All right. <laughs> um, this stuff came later. I'm just going to just give you a sense of like sort of what I was used to. This never existed. I, I can't emphasize this enough. Like Austin was a great town. When I first moved there, you could go across town in about 10 minutes uh, in your car. That's sort of like St. John's now. But as the city grew, you know, there's about a million people there now plus. Um, and lots and lots of commuters coming from the outside. Um, it just became impossible to get across town and gridlock every day at four o'clock. Um, so um, they started to, as, you know, they got to be a bigger city and started to actually put some infrastructure in here. This is uh, right by the University of Texas, which is on the right there. And that's a uh, separated bike lane on the main drag. I cannot get that straight. It's a typical bike lane I would take. You know, you can see it. Uh, I would typically avoid this route, though. I'll, I'll, occasionally, I would take it. I'm in favor of smaller back streets that were just had. Th there's a bus. Actually, that's a bus stop right there. Um, so, typically, I would I would just avoid this. Although it's nice to know the infrastructure was there if you needed it. Um, you know, so the Texas style micro roundabout. Lots of traffic calming. These are the back neighborhoods, and this is why it's actually so nice to bike back there. Um, cars don't really use these as um, serious thoroughfares, just mostly for neighborhood stuff. Um, this is basically my route I used to take to get to the university. Um, we live sort of up there. And I just wanted to show you that it's like extremely DIY, like, it's like choose your own adventure. Um, there's a long, you can probably see that long sort of diagonal road that is Sort of like the one I showed you, it's just basically a long road, fairly busy, um, with a not a separated lane, just a painted lane. But all the rest of them are pretty, felt pretty safe. Um, this is like bike culture down there. Uh, there's a famous Thursday night social bike ride, which is incredible, maybe a hundred people sometimes. Um, multiple waves and stoplights, uh, it's a no dropout bike. Uh, super fun, they ended up our and back to reality, okay. Uh, drivers own this city. This is a thing that could, I'm just gonna show you sort of how I experience the city. Um, I live downtown, so this is the kind of thing that um, drives me crazy, causes me problems. There's stairs there, there's no ramp here. Um, so I go into this lane sometimes. I go down, I don't go up anymore, it's too dangerous. In the right lane, I mean. Um, but if I have a stroller, if I have a bike, that's how I'm getting down. Because otherwise you have to go to McBride's Hill or you have to go over to I think it's St. John's Lane. Um, you know, we're second class citizens here. Yeah. Uh, this is what I'm finding though is that uh, it's a retention issue. People are willing to make do here, but um, too many hardships are pushing them away. And that's an example. Uh, this is my favorite <laughs> snowbank now. <laughs> So, this is a block from Mission Field School. It's a couple blocks from my house. And um, I think this is a city lot, and I'd love to find out for sure, but um, I watched this person, the plow operator, plow this spot one day, 
And basically, there's a tiny parking lot, I think maybe four or five, you can see the red car there, four or five cars can line up there. So they go in, remove the snow from the lot, and then they drop it here. And I watched it one day turn into, it was like one foot, and then I came back the next day, and I mean, it's over my head. And this is on the school route. I am familiar with the snowbank. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that one was, you know, just really struck me. Um, so this is the kind of stuff that we just can't do anymore. Um, for instance, I think this was plowed by the sidewalk plow, just on the far right photo here. But then this is, it looks like Rollins Cross, I think. And then, um, of course, you can't actually make it across uh, in any kind of safe way. Um, on the top left there is uh, my daughter, and that's the bottom of Chapel Street. Um, so every day at about three, I guess, I see this kid might be eight or nine, stop at that corner and look both ways and then run across that little street because drivers are insane on that uh, section. I, they just come barreling down there and the kid is right to be concerned. Um, you know, an easy fix would be to have a bump out for crossing to make the crossing safer and shorter. Ditto for the cross to Bannerman. Like we had those red barriers. What the fuck are they? <laughs> Gone. Uh, yeah, every day I feel like I could be run over and that's the state of things. Aggressive drivers um, are just one factor. It's really aggressive street designs. We're still not building complete streets with bike lanes. And as far as I can tell, protective bike lanes should be the new sidewalks. Um, we're trapped by trails. This is like the one, so after the accident, one safe thing we did was rode the trails on the south side. But, um, you know, you can't actually get to the trails without going through some of these incredibly dangerous streets. Um, anyway, especially after the, the uh, pedestrian mall closed. So then we went on Harbor Drive and I was like, this is terrifying. Um, so we went on the sidewalk the whole way and that was a real adventure. Um, these are three traps that like, um, I experience every now and then I avoid these streets um, as much as I can, but basically there's no escape. There's no safe escape from downtown. So um, Logie Bay, Tor Bay, from right to left, Logie Bay, Tor Bay, uh, Portugal Cove Road, and then you get Parapasian that links up to Portugal Cove Road. Um, depth traps, all three, um, needlessly wide. They are, this is Portugal Cove Road. I drove this in a kind of dusk one time in, in the summer. And you know, I'm cruising there on the right lane and then there's some car going 80 next to me. Um, inner city highway, basically. And there's no traffic there. I mean, by anyone who's lived in a bigger city can tell you this is kid stuff. Like, we can do fine. We can get rid of two of those lanes at two bike lanes on each side. But you are trapped, you know, you can't, so I went to the sidewalk then, and I, as, uh, that was just me solo, and you know, I had never ridden on the sidewalk as an adult, except in extremely dire circumstances, and that was one of them, so. Uh, it was, just took forever. Lots of more examples, Elizabeth did out. Uh, and then, that's Carpathian. Where do you go? Drivers could run you over on the right, in the center, in the left. Um, <laughs> there are no lines. There's no. There's parking. You can park on the right, but uh, there's no line there. Um, so what should we do, right? Road diets, traffic calming everywhere. There's no reason to have any excuse anymore. Um, like I think they're just proposing more development in Kimmel Terrace. But has anyone seen the mock-up? Are they actually going to add? Can we get complete streets in this city? Like, it, it's not only do, I mean, we're behind, we're so far behind. Yeah. And it's always more expensive to retrofit. Yep. Um, this is some of the, now like, Austin is a super rich city. Um, so, you know, don't get too excited, but I'll just show you in the bottom left. This is a, a pedestrian um, cycling bridge across the major river that goes through downtown Austin. And if you can see there on the left, that's a, it's a they're, they're all accessible by ramps. So cyclists can go up essentially at full speed. Um, and it's wide enough to, to like mingle with pedestrians in a fairly safe way. Um, it's also well marked. So there's a central bike path. Um, there are textures on it that indicate where you should be. 
And you can see the loop there. So it actually is pretty cool. The, the sort of circle on the left there puts you down to the hike and bike trail, which is a multi-use path. And, um, you know, they didn't just put one line across, you know what I mean? They really thought about how they could make this good. Um, here's an example of a kind of super cheap separated bike lane that I used to ride all the time over a bridge. Um, this is a, they had a similar problem, you know, for no reason this bridge was uh, not that well traveled, probably had room for two cars minimum. There's a sidewalk to the right here, it's out of frame. Um, and so they just said, well, we're just gonna put down a bike lane on the right side and have this separated with these little plastic things. Um, a huge improvement, incredibly cheap. Um, I do see potential here though, in surprising places. So I, this is Snowmageddon. I just wanted to remember sometimes how little room cars actually need to pass. <laughs> Um, when Snowmageddon, okay. Snowmageddon happened, um, you can see my daughter over here walking around like baby Gandalf. Uh, <laughs> this is Carpathian Road, actually. It was that point where like they plowed the main roads, I guess. We actually slid down this hill that night, I think. Uh, but there were still no cars out. And it was absolute paradise, yeah. you know? I don't know, a lot of people remember that part of it, at least fondly. Um, on day four, I guess, or I don't even know, maybe later, Three days of this, I'll never forget it. But um, you know, my daughter, we were walking across the street to her car, and a car suddenly came up Mullet Street where we were living at the time. And uh, man, the look on her face—she couldn't believe. She was terrified, you know. Um, but it was like she'd gone back to. She felt so comfortable, and um, yeah, uh, it was paradise for a few minutes. There. Can I just say that's my house right there? Oh yeah. And we plow that sidewalk with our snowblower. Yeah. And then the city comes and pushes that snow oh, right. every time Plastic. over the top of the sidewalk. It's awesome. Every time. Absolutely. Um, you know, we have so much potential. The, the pedestrian ball inadvertently, like in the city hall, still don't understand what they did. Uh, they still they did it, but they don't understand it. Um, but they inadvertently, you can see the cyclists over there, a stroller uh, person on the top left there. They created the only, uh, you know, car-free zone in the city, and uh, overnight you could get through downtown on the cyclist car-free. It is absolutely incredible, and I mean, I don't know what what else people need to know about that other than that it was a mind-blowing success that should be repeated and continues. Like, I'm not sure what the question is. I guess it's. They've messed it up by putting it under the events category, and so now they're paying too much for it to happen. But uh, we do, do know how to do this, and we could fix it. Um, I just couldn't believe how this is the intersection next to the Anglican Cathedral, um, Gower Street United Church, um, you know, the bottom of Garrison Hill. I couldn't believe, looking at this Google um, Street View image, how much road there used to be there, and uh, how much better it is now for people on foot and on wheels. So we can do this. We know how to do it. Um, Quebec City, does Montreal, has anyone ridden Montreal bike lanes? They're amazing, right? Like it is, that'll, that'll blow your brain if you've never done it before. That'll transform how you think about uh, mobility in a city overnight. And Montreal yes. has hills and old buildings yes. and all the things we have there. Totally. We had a big we went down to, to old Montreal and like, you know, had to huff and puff up a tall city. I think we had to walk. It's fine. Yeah. We could do it, but like these wide roads, we, we have to end this, and this is a really simple fix, I think. Um, this is my kid going across King's Road, which I get, I'm guessing, does anyone know that was a one-way at some point, and got converted to a two-way, or sorry, it was a two-way and got converted to a one-way. Yeah. But like, they're so generous to drivers. <laughs> so <laughs> the driver gets a turn lane. Nobody uses this road, like, you know, it's like a car every couple of minutes, like, um, yeah, but they- have to drop off the Yes, well, and you know, sure, fair enough, but um, you know, it's so wide, and you know, every road, that's one thing too that happened in Texas um, as we started to live there, and don't get me wrong, I, we were driving a lot, it was really inconvenient. Traffic calming is confusing for drivers, they're like, why are you making my life worse? Well, that's the trade-off, you know? But um, they were also, also stopped doing those um, 
I don't know what you call them, the, the really wide curves that um, let you go at high speed and uh, really constricting the curve, bringing it, almost making it a 90 degree turn. And you know, if you just look at how uh, generous they were in drivers at every opportunity, um, it, but it really hurts the pedestrian. Does that mean that's the end? I don't know, probably. Thank you guys, I appreciate it. <laughs> Okay, we're, we are a fair bit over time, and uh, which I think was very worthwhile because the panelists had so much, so many insights and experiences to talk about. But I think instead of taking questions now, because although Debbie said her presentation, we can? Yes. Yeah? Oh, okay. Well, I guess we did <laughs> for a few questions. Um, so, um, if there are uh, if there are questions, you'll also have a chance to talk to the panelists individually um, at the break or at lunchtime. But are there questions or comments? Yeah. Um, first, uh, yes. Uh, hi, my name's Yvonne, and I live in the Elizabeth Avenue area. I do own a car, but it generally sits in the driveway. So um, I'm, I'm somebody who walks St. John's. And one of the things that I have been noticing, uh, yeah. and you alluded to it, um, um, but one of the things I'm noticing is I am now having to share the sidewalks, inadequate as they are, with adult bicyclists, not with kids. I have no problems with the kids at all. Um, but, um, and there is one person in the university neighborhood who's using an electric bike and seems to think that an electric bike belongs on the sidewalk as well. And I was just the other day um, hearing that that's become an issue in cities like San Francisco to the point that they're having to deal with the fact that the pedestrians are trying to take back the sidewalks. So I'm just wondering, I know bike lanes are one of the, or maybe one of the solutions, but I, I think we need to remember the pedestrians as well. So is there comments and anything that you want to say? I mean, I ride the sidewalk um, I'm, with my kid anyway, and there was a time when after the accident, what was on the accident after the crash, um, that um, I wasn't riding anywhere. So, uh, I, I mean, I certainly try to be accommodating, but uh, I can't apologize for <laughs> riding on the sidewalk. You know what I mean? Like, it, there's, it, it was, it's pretty striking to, to, you know, almost die on the road. So if you've had a close call, I think, uh, I don't want to ride the sidewalk. No, and I'm not, I'm not yeah. pointing out, I'm, I'm just talking about the fact that if this is becoming more of an issue, yeah. it's something that we need dealing with in the pedestrian community as well as the biking community? Yeah, it would be great if pedestrians because would advocate for cy cycling lanes, right? Yeah. Because we don't want to be on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's a really good point, I think, and one that we could spend a lot of time discussing. And I, I will admit that I also have taken to riding on the sidewalk. I'm getting older. I feel more fragile. and. Um, it has never been very safe here anyway for cycling. Uh, so I ride on the sidewalks, and most of the people I see riding on the sidewalks are either kids, teenagers or kids, or seniors, I've noticed, just my informal observations. And I was thinking that when they do the bike pole in the spring, it might be interesting to actually collect data beyond what the bike pole actually collects. Another thing that would be interesting to look at is how many are riding on the sidewalk and who is riding on the sidewalk because data might possibly be one way of advocating for better infrastructure. And I think also Luke's point about these streets that have massive amounts of space allocated for private vehicles, well, for, for vehicles, um, uh, with very little traffic. So really, it's a, a question of rethinking how many lanes you need for cars and how many lanes might be allocated for other purposes. 
I mean, um, Elizabeth, yeah, Elizabeth Avenue just narrows down from four lanes to two in the central section. I mean, so why yeah. do you need the four at all? Yeah, you don't. Exactly. Yeah. And I think A maybe wanted to respond as well. Yep. I was going to hand it to Mike. Okay. I'll stand. Okay. Oh, yeah. No, it's okay. So you can also stand and walk a bit. Um, if you ever see me walking, I'm not like pretending and doing the disability fraud thing. <laughs> it's just me there. Um, I think this speaks to the bigger issue and the one that really needs looking at, which is um, we need to be focusing on structures and how structures need to change versus how people and how we're moving and living and want need to change. So there's something called the social model of disability, where it's that I'm not um, disabled because I have to use a wheelchair, I'm disabled because the building doesn't have a ramp. Or, um, you know, if you're living, uh, if you're an autistic person and there's like no quiet space, well, say, you know, like, that's what's stopping you from going, not because um, you have autism. So if we start to spin that in the same way around these issues, because what I see tends to happen, especially in terms of politics and stuff, is first it's like, we'll only give a little bit of funding to these places, so then they're scrambling and sometimes dividing and fighting amongst themselves for crumbs of what's needed. Um, and then if, and I've seen it, and it's understandable, if pedestrians and bike people using bikes and people using wheelchairs and I mean, same thing happens with the go bus system. It's like, okay, well, I'm gonna be angry at you because you're using this system and you shouldn't be versus how come we just don't get more money? Because obviously it's a system that's working and needs a lot of more buses because there's a lot of users, right? Yeah, totally. Like, let's focus on what's really happening here. Like, imagine like, how much money are they spending on this inquisition with all these experts coming in and like, why is that not going to the go bus? And let me tell you, when I was using it seven years ago, like it was not run efficiently, partly because they spent $750,000 on a system that never worked first nor last. I would talk with the drivers and they said they would get the person who made the system to come down and he couldn't figure it out. And so it wasn't working effectively, and, but they wouldn't get another system because they'd spent $750,000 on it and they didn't know how to justify that. So then this is, this is the result, what we're seeing here, this inquisition that is like, you know, people are gonna be going to drama therapists about, I can't even imagine what that, like I already know my experience was horrible. So how do we shift so that it's not, like, not about us and us trying to fight for the little bit of space or the little bit of money or a little bit of community, but we're trying to actually create bigger space and say we deserve this and it is ours and you have to change like the structures and the people and how we're doing things and i know that's easier said than done but like that's the focus radical inclusion not barely enough radical inclusion something that's real thank you that's so inspiring <laughs> uh josh i think has a yeah, actually, so it's like kind of connected to that, and I, I'm just thinking about like, um, so I think you've all spoken really powerfully to why we need more diverse sort of lived experiences in decision making positions, but we don't have that now. Yeah. Uh, it's mostly like car driving white dudes who run the show, right? Yeah. And so I, I, like I'm just thinking about like what are some strategies to reach the car driving white dudes who run the show now? You know, like because I'm I, you both I think Anne and A you both kind of put some skepticism on the like put yourself in a wheelchair for a day kind of version of that. But I'm just, I, like, I, I guess, yeah, what are some tactics here, maybe for the other people in the room too, like what, what should we be doing to, to get decision makers' heads wrapped around all the things that you've all said, or like what can we, yeah, maybe that's, that's kind of where I have to go. No, you go, I'm still there, That, that is a very tough nut to crack, it just is. When you look upon, I think we can, most of us acknowledge that a lot of the systems and institutions that kind of run our society are kind of, we're, we're constructed within a sort of white supremacist, colonial, male, advantaged framework. Um, I mean, every reiteration of that, of those models will do that. 
they'll just reiterate the same thing. It'll just look more sanitized. But um, I think I kind of look at a pyramid, and I, I, I look at privilege this way, um, because I don't consider myself a person of like extreme privilege, and certainly not financially. I just go, but you know what? There's more of us than there are of them, and it's just keep talking, keep, keep uh, in solidarity together about this. Um, I think public protest does work. It gets attention. Um, just sitting around and complaining about it amongst ourselves is not going to help. I think we really have to put the active in the word activist. Honestly, I, I don't know of any underprivileged minority, and I think that pedestrians kind of live that to some extent in St. John's, that's ever won equity without really, uh, really going for it. And, and we're building momentum. We're building critical mass. Uh, it will happen. It will happen, yeah. and I hope it happens okay. sooner rather than later. Um, I could add a little bit to that. Yeah. Um, can you hear me okay with the thick mask on? Okay. So um, I think one thing, like trying to come up with these radical, creative challenges to the city, like you know, and I. I literally just said this a couple of days ago to Elizabeth, so I had to figure out how do I get that somewhere that it might actually do something in terms of like clear the you know the sidewalks for three weeks during December and see what the difference. Because like in my experience of 20 years of advocating in these systems, it's often what works best is when you're talking to them with the language that they use and the ideas that have meaning to them. So often it does come down to a lot of money. So then try to flip that back. Okay, if it's about a lot of money, well then how much more money could we make if people are able to access all of these things? Um, another piece would be um, that, you know, uh, voted different city councilors, which is like an obvious, but uh, there are some of us that are thinking about running next time and maybe on a slate. And so to really just try to, to like turn it upside down because it is obviously not working except for like, once again, a very few people. Um, and I had another thing and didn't write it down and being very diverse and told us about it. Um, the whole writing, yeah, go ahead. If I think of it all. Okay, I was, yeah. was going to say one thing while you think. And yes, yeah, yeah. Um, another thing I've been thinking about recently, I've been fighting for cleared sidewalks for over 30 years now. <laughs> that was how I started getting interested in these issues was the, the sidewalk. And, um, we're at 10% after 30 years. So that's even a lot worse than your, uh, what was it? Two, two acceptable crosswalks per year. Um, and so I'm starting to think about tactical urbanism. You know, I'm starting to feel that, you know, the advisory committees and the public engagement, I mean, I suppose we still have to do them because if we don't, they'll think we acquiesce. But, uh, but really, I think maybe we need to put some energy into tactical urbanism, peaceful tactical urbanism. But, you know, for instance, next time, instead of using chalk to mark things on the sidewalks to help people with visual impairment, let's use paint. You know, there are a lot of simple things that people can do. So maybe I'm being a little bit radical, at least for me, because I'm a very non-confrontational person. <laughs> but, but I am getting more and more interested in what I believe is called tactical urbanism actually doing some things ourselves. So that's just another thought. And did you think of your thought, Ed? I didn't think of the previous thought, but one other one that I had, which um, again, I've seen over and over again, is if we could um, have education pieces for the people like literally doing the plowing. So like we could change policies, we could change politicians, we could change all those things, but it often it comes right down to the person who's doing the thing that is not working for a whole bunch of other people. And often, I don't think that most of them are maliciously like, hee 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 hee, I'm gonna like put all the, you know, it's like out of need, like because nobody else has told them where else to put it, or, you know, they're like out in the middle of the night and they're half asleep. So, but often if people get an understanding of the impact that those things can have, when for them maybe it's like, oh, there's just a bunch of snow in this one area, they're not getting all the ripple effects 
for the person who's using a stroller and you know or the child's walking to school or you know i'm trying to get my wheelchair down the, the road or Anne is going down with their guide dog mm -hmm. or any of those things or somebody trying to bite then and that often uh, and that's people's empathy much more than just like again coming from anger or like you have to do this and da 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 but if we could get more of a community piece and actually have conversations and like training or points to think about when they are plowing, like that would be a concrete way to do something about it right now that maybe wouldn't cost that much money if we decided to do it on a volunteer basis, but <laughs> to get it started, I don't know. Um, maybe we should have another meeting or a neighborhood summit about where do we go from here? Yeah. It yeah. could be good actually. And do you want to say something too? Yeah, one of the things that I think would be super useful would be um, if there was an accessibility, and by that I mean universal accessibility, audit of the entire city. So that we will literally be left with a picture of exactly what the problems are and where they exist. Um, somebody was talking about you were about the accessible, uh, about affordable housing and how weirdly it's located sometimes. Like it's literally in food deserts often or very inaccessible places. So I, example, for example, as a person with a disability, when I, I moved, like I'm very nomadic <laughs> within War II, it's terrible. But I keep looking for that one little 15 minute neighborhood situation, right? Mm -hmm. Where I can walk safely, just to, just to get, you know, food, <laughs> a beer, whatever. Um, I've yet to find it, right? And what, what people don't understand, what people who drive may not understand is, if you are coming to the city or you already live in the city and you don't have that vehicle in your possession and the finances to run it whenever you want to, that is, that is actually going to be one of the primary determinants of your choices of where to live. You want to be able to live in a place where you're not going to be super isolated, right? So in a, when, when you're looking for housing, for example, on Kijiji, you'll see some certain scoring um, charts, right? So we have walking scores. I don't know, do we have cycling scores? If we had that accessibility audit, we would have biking scores for neighborhoods and like disability accommodation scores for neighborhoods. That one thing in itself would be very helpful to a lot of people. But the audit piece of it, actually there's no way any, it, it's sometimes because these things haven't really been quantified and identified in a manner that you can sort of grasp it in, in a, a look, if you can see, right? Mm -hmm. um, the language around it is kind of slippery and vague, and there's a lot of hyperbole sometimes, and not enough other times. But I think that if we had that audit done, right, we could all see how dire the situation is, and it is, and then from there, based on a number of quantify or qualifying factors that have yet to be developed, depending on priority, then we can go ahead and have an actual coherent plan rather than this pell-mell, hodgepodge, bit here, bit there, like me, no connectivity result that we have now. I, I certainly think that's worth considering. Thank you. And so I mentioned at the very beginning of this, long session that uh, the St. John's climate plan, one of the things they have committed to doing is a full assessment of pedestrian infrastructure. So I don't know to what extent that includes accessibility, but I would think it should. And so as individuals here, if you want to go home and write to the city and say, I know that in your climate action plan, you're going to do assessment of pedestrian infrastructure, Will that include accessibility assessment? We need this, we need both these things. So, you know, if you'd like to just mentally commit to sending an email to city council when you get home on that topic and ask them, that would be a little step we can take, I think. And one tip, whenever you're advocating on that, send it to the entire council, 
send it to the disability policy office, send it to the inclusion committee, all on the one email, I did this, and they literally sometimes trip over themselves. But if it's just you to the one counselor, it can sit in their inbox and who's making them accountable. But as long as other people are copied on that and seeing it, then that gets people laughing here, sadly. And you could copy it to the media too. Yes, and the media too. Media <laughs> are an important piece, I think. If you're comfortable with that, don't have to cross the boundaries either. Yeah. It's also very appropriate to send, um, to help the Human Rights Commission build an archive of this stuff. Oh, yeah. So copy also to Carrie Majid at the Human Rights Commission. Because well, it is when, when we say disability rights are human rights, that's a fact, right? And more and more globally, pedestrian rights, like, Formerly, we often thought of mobility justice as kind of being uh, related to borders, but if there's a growing movement towards urban mobility justice in a human rights context. And as you might know, the human rights, um, the human rights code is a fluid document, it's a living document. Things get added as they arise in priority in social and cultural kind of contexts. So it's a thing. Um, I'm not sure if I've got one more person who had a question. If so, we can take it before the break. Did I or not? No, maybe not, or maybe they would like a break. But we can continue the conversation at the break and at lunch. And um, if any of you are not sure how to contact the Human Rights Commission or City Council and so on, you can ask any of us at, at the break and we'll let you know. So that's it for me. I guess Debbie may have a word or two. And um, can I just ask for applause for the panel? Thank you all so much for all your presentation. Yeah, so this session was so great that we decided to extend it. I didn't know, as you can tell. Um, and so we're going to combine our break and our lunch break together. So we're going to come back at about 1.15. Feel free to grab a coffee outside and tea or a muffin and a cookie for your dessert, whatever you want to do. And um, I was just going to comment, when you're emailing your counselors, why don't you ask them why they weren't here today? And let's thank all this great yes. information. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. That's it. Thank you. If you didn't hear Elizabeth, she said, somebody's already tweeted, hey, City of St. John's, why aren't you here? Hey, uh, Ophelia, why aren't you here? So feel free to call out your own counselors and ask them whether or not here by email and social media.